Just a minute, please. You can't go in there. You can't go in there. You can't go in there. I said you can't go in there. You can't go in there. Sir, you can't go in there. 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 Get back. But you can't go in there. You can't go in there. You can't go in there. It's okay. I'm a limo driver. You can't go in there. No. Oh, you can't go in there. Oh, you can't go in there. So this is a restricted area. You can't go in there. Wait, you can't go in there. You can't go in there. Oh, hey. No. Sure you can come in. In fact, I want you to come in and check out the progress. Let's go. Well, fancy meeting you here, you wonderful people of YouTube. My name is Elon Osborne, and I wanted to give you another update on the home theater testing room that I've been building. As you might have guessed, I am currently filming in the testing room, since it is in fact a room with walls. And when it's complete, I think I might continue filming in here. It's kind of cozy, and it doesn't exactly sound like a dungeon like the garage. Any whatever, when you last joined me, I had just finished building the walls of the room, so now it was time to get some electrical and speaker wires in place. In order to make sure I had plenty of electricity going into this room, I planned on splitting the room in half with one side connected to a 20 amp circuit and the other half connected to a separate 20 amp circuit. Now, in all honesty, that's probably overkill. More than likely, one 20 amp circuit is enough for the whole room, but I wanted to be absolutely sure that I find powering a large TV, powering more than one external amp, possibly running a 300 watt per channel integrated amp, 4K Blu-ray player, a couple of beefy subwoofers, nine bed layer speakers, six height speakers, and a preamp or an AV receiver, I didn't want to trip the circuit whatsoever. So with that being said, hopefully, my math is correct and I'm supplying way more than enough electricity to the room. The electrical wires in particular would need to travel up this 4x4 and over to the electrical panel in the corner of the shed. Before I move on, you can see that the exterior walls of this shed are supported in a fairly lazy way. There are a few horizontal 2x4s that span the distance between the 4x4s along the wall. Instead of having vertical studs every 16 inches like a normal wall, if this were my dream home theater, I would have spent the time and money to turn those exterior walls into real walls. But since this was just meant for a rough testing facility, I continued the horizontal braces on the front wall. It really doesn't create a very sturdy wall in the end, pretty wobbly. So I did end up adding four braces up high to allow for more points I could screw in the drywall eventually. But looking back on it, I kind of wish that I had done a proper wall like I did here because man, these walls have a lot of give to them. Oh well, the budget on this room was already ballooning more than I had hoped, so I just went with it. Okay, back to the electrical. I wanted the two outlets at the front of the room to be the same distance from the wall, so I measured those out and hammered outlet boxes in place. I did the same for the back wall and the side walls. I wanted to make sure that I had outlets all around the room so I could plug in subwoofers and possibly powered speakers like WISA certified speakers or soundbar surround speakers, and that way I could put them wherever they needed to be. Now, before any wires could be snaked, some holes needed to be drilled. I went ahead and drilled for the Romex wire first, then drilled for the speaker wires. Now, one thing I did not want to happen is to have electrical wires cross paths with speaker wires, because that could cause some audible interference to be heard eventually coming through the speaker. So I mapped out pathways that would cause the electrical and speaker wires to steer clear of each other. So I then snaked the electrical wire to the outlet boxes, then snaked them to the electrical panel. And of course, I then secured the wires along their respective pathways with Romex staples so they weren't just dangling in the open air. Next, one of my general philosophies in life is to start with the hardest first, just to get it over with, right? So I knew the voice of God speaker plate and speaker wire would be the trickiest since it would be the only one that currently had drywall in its way. 
So I measured where it would be and cut a small hole for the speaker plate and installed it. Then I snaked some wire in place and secured it so that I could go into the attic crawl space, carefully bring it to the installed speaker plate and get those copper wires touching those terminals. It was not easy. Then I cut it to size and let it hang roughly where it needed to go. Then I hammered some more staples in place along the pathway that all the speaker wires on the left side of the room would take. Since they would all converge into the same spot, I needed to label them as I went. TBH, at the time, I thought I had an extra slot for a random speaker that I could utilize in the future, so I labeled it extra. <laughs> Turns out I miscalculated, so that extra wasn't extra after all. Then came the repetitive journey back and forth, snaking speaker wire after speaker wire. Remember, I'm trying to account for all the speaker configurations that I might run into reviewing home audio on YouTube. Next up is the drywall. Trying to recycle as much as I could, I was able to use quite a bit of the drywall that I took off the previous wall, but I definitely needed some more. So I got some more and brought it all in. The bottom pieces were the easiest, of course, since I could basically put them where they needed to be, then screw them in by myself. Again, starting with the hardest first, the front wall was going to be a beast because that's where everything converged. I ended up getting an 8.2 speaker wall plate even though I knew I wouldn't be using the two subwoofer connections. But it was convenient that it was labeled and everything. So I cut out the respective holes needed and got the drywall in place. My in-laws then helped get the massive 12 foot long drywall piece in place up high. Then to get the tougher pieces out of the way, my wife and I got the rest of the upper pieces in place, followed by the lower. But while we were putting up that drywall, this massive oak tree decided to fall over. Luckily, no one was anywhere in the vicinity, so that was a big sigh of relief. Anywho, then we filled in the center section and voila, a fully drywalled room. Now, obviously it's not the smoothest job done, but that wasn't the goal. I wanted it to be rough with edges sticking out and lots of character. I left the screw holes visible so I could easily see where the studs are, etc. Again, not my dream home theater. This is a DIY laboratory, not a showroom. After that, it was time to spackle the cracks a bit, then get some primer on there. Oh boy, then came the time to get some Elon Osborne headphone logo blue all over, which made it even darker. Nice. Then came the task of connecting all those speaker wires to the main plates on the front wall. Man, that was tedious, but somebody had to do it. Then I finished up the remainder of the speaker wall plates around the room, as well as the XLR plates too, if and when I review subwoofers with XLR inputs on them. Although my soldering skills were so rusty from my days building microphones for a well-known pro audio company over a decade ago. So that sucked but it got done eventually. And lastly in this video, acoustic treatment. When I was fresh out of audio engineering school in LA back in the day, I responded to a Craigslist ad saying a local music studio had upgraded their acoustic treatment and were going to get rid of all their old foam for a hundred bucks. I don't know if you knew this, but like almost everything in the pro audio sector, acoustic treatment is expensive. So all that for a hundred bucks was a steal. At the time I had a small room off the master bedroom that I turned into my music mixing studio. So that foam came in handy and I've hung on to it ever since. So might as well use it again because I sure as hell don't want to pay for acoustic treatment at the moment with prices sky high. So boom, boom, boom. I'm once again making use of my trusty acoustic foam. But even after all that acoustic foam was in place, the reflections were still kind of bad. That's because the floor was still concrete, even as I record this right now. I don't know if you can hear this, but there are some pretty bad reflections if I clap. Uh, what? I gotta tell you, this is uh, riveting. Hear that? Not as bad as a garage, but uh -huh. still there. Now, there is a rug that's on its way that will take up this entire space, but I'll feature that in the next video. But that just goes to show you, floors are extremely important when it comes to acoustic treatment. Walls and ceilings, yes, but floors? You gotta get some carpet, rugs, or whatever other fabric down there to absorb and deaden the reflections of your room. And there you have it, folks. That's as far as I've gotten on this home theater testing room so far. I sure hope something from this video made you think about your own goals with home audio or maybe even inspired you in some way. Whether that be any of the planning stages or wiring techniques or wall plates that I incorporated. Links to everything in the description below. 
of course. Feel free to ask any questions or comment your hearts out, please. Let's get a conversation started, shall we? As always, please be kind to each other out there. Don't just watch TV and movies, experience them. And of course, always be listening.